Hey, good evening, and welcome to an extremely special edition of Montpelier Civic Forum, which, as all of you know who've watched the show, it's normally done in the winter. It's done after January, after people have declared as candidates, and we're preparing for town meeting day. And this is going to be really special because in the reopening, I wanted to get an assessment from the people who know as to what in the world is going on. So we're going to have a couple of really good shows. Bill Fraser will be here. In fact, he's here right now with me. Ann Watson will be here with the overview from the mayor's seat. We're going to have uh, Libby and Jim from the schools to talk about what is going on, what has gone on with the schools, what is the planning, and what their projection on the fall is. And then um, hopefully, this one hasn't been firmed up, but I believe it will happen. We're going to have a really good one with the two police chiefs, the outgoing chief and the new chief, where they'll discuss 21st century policing. And you'll get some sense of how the baton is being passed from one police chief who's been working on this issue to the next police chief. That's going to be a very good one. Uh, as I said, tonight I have Bill Fraser, and I'm really pleased, and I want to tell you that, yes, indeed, I do have the mask. And the mask is right here, and Bill has his mask over there. We're 10 feet apart. Uh, I just thought you wanted to see us talking. So we are following the protocols. When we leave, we'll have the masks on. And Bill, I want to thank you for being here. My pleasure. Always happy to talk to you. Uh, you notice I haven't dropped in your office in City Hall for a while? That's because we've been closed and locked. <laughs> well, not for want of trying. <laughs> That's right. Uh, last that we spoke was the uh, COVID was here. But we didn't address it at all. Not when I it was it right wasn't at all. You know, it, it just was not on the horizon of Vermont in early February. Um, and then I, I have to do the corny joke now. And, and how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? <laughs> It's been a wild ride for you. It sure has. It's you know we're in our 14th week, and uh, really you know like every, you know the city government's not any different than you know small businesses, large businesses, uh, employees, you know our residents. Uh, things have just changed drastically. The way. The way we do things, I mean, it feels odd. You know, we, I just you know, was kidding, but we, our city hall is locked, and we don't have public coming in, and that's for a safety precaution. But for you know, our business is to is to work with our people and to be accessible. So it, it's strange. It's a, it's it feels odd in there. There's just a handful of us working in the building, and you you know, it's just a big empty place, and it, it's, uh, but. That's the least of our problems. I mean, there are people out of work. There are you know people who are hurting and suffering, and we're just trying to figure out how to provide uh, the most basic essential services to people, uh, and at the same time balance our budget because we've taken a lot of financial hit ourselves. We the public, better. yeah, and so we obviously don't want to run up a deficit on behalf of the public, nor do we want to have to raise additional revenues uh, that people are you know having a hard enough time paying. The ones they're expected to pay, so um, it's it's been challenging in that regard, and and then obviously other events have, have just added to uh, to our uh, level of activity. Now I hope again this is another one of those shows. I, uh, John Odom has said he'll come in to speak about uh, the election that's coming up. Um, delinquent property taxes and the like. What's going on with that? So we just, uh, the taxes were just due on the 15th, uh, so two days ago as, as we're filming this. Um, right now, it appears we're about on our normal target, maybe just a shade behind. Um, I'm getting a full report tomorrow, actually, uh, but got the snapshot today, and it was, you know, about where we normally are. Uh, so, so far, so good. Um, but again, it's hard to say because people have been getting, you know, the PPP, and they've been getting the additional unemployment. You know, I, I worry about what might actually happen for the next quarter's installment when, when people don't necessarily maybe don't have those benefits if if work isn't back. So we're, you know, I, this is not a. A one-off. This is this is the one time we're going to have this problem. We're concerned that it's going to have a big impact going into the future. Now people are learning. In City Hall, people have always known this: the importance of the parking fund. Yeah. Could you discuss? Well, you know, parking first and foremost is designed to manage parking downtown, and I think that is important that, that people understand. You know, we're we're trying to. Um, Make sure that there's turnover to make sure that there's you know 
parking is allocated in a way so that people can get to businesses but not stay all day and employees aren't parking on, in, on the street all day. But that includes costs for the employees, that includes the costs of leasing parking spaces, it includes costs of maintaining parking spaces, and all of that comes from the revenues either from the meters or parking lot permits or from fines. And that includes offsets to some of our police department's work because they deal with some of that and some of our DPW and that kind of thing. Um, How long have the meters been free at this point? Well, so we turned them off the very first meeting in March after the pandemic hit, once once the or governor's orders came to basically close down businesses, um, there was, you know, at that point there was no parking demand, and it seemed cruel to charge people to park to come to an empty downtown, uh, or for the one or two things that they might be able to legally do or take out or or whatever, and and the policy need wasn't there. There was no need to manage parking, so we turned off the meters at that point, and um, you know we. We have, we're now having regular conversations. We do see a lot of people parking, but we don't know how many of them are all day, you know, business owners, store people, and how many of them are shoppers. So we're trying to keep, uh, you know, work with Montpelier Alive to, to talk to the businesses to get a sense of when they feel it's needed again. Um, but in the meantime, it costs, it's costing us money. What's a rough estimate of how much we've lost? In parking? Lost meters, yeah. Three or $400,000 probably, yeah. Just in a quarter. Well, no, that's high. Two hundred thousand dollars in a quarter, which is a sizable hit. Yeah, it's a very sizable hit. Sure. Is there any other re revenue? The senior center, I think, we've lost revenue there. Where so, else have we lost revenue? So, our, yeah. So, our, that's a great question because a lot of people uh, ask, including our own employees. You know, gee, we passed our budget. What, what's the problem? Well, our budget was passed on. You know, so much coming from property taxes and so much from water and sewer, but it also included, you know, parking revenues. Program revenues, so user to, revenues. User right? Fees. User revenues, user fees. Uh, so, rec, all the rec programs, all the senior center programs, rooms, meals, and alcohol taxes. You know, we have a one percent local options tax for those items. Uh, you know, up until this week, nobody was staying in rooms, buying meals, or you know, drinking in drinking establishments, or very few people. Um, so that basically went away. Um, we have uh, our payment lieu of taxes. Uh, we have. Would got you a, explain what that is? Sure. So the state pays. That's uh, known as pilot. Pilot, correct. So a, our, the state pays a pilot payment to communities that have state properties, and uh, it's based on the value of those state properties. Uh, we, of course, have the highest pilot payment of anybody in the state because of all of our downtown, and and all told, it's about nine hundred thousand dollars. It's it's you know they're up to. A sizable payment, but that money comes from local options taxes, including local sales taxes from towns and cities all around the state. So when a, a town like Montpelier enacts a local options tax, in our case, rooms, meals, and alcohol, we keep seventy percent, and the rest of the thirty percent goes to the state. I think they keep five for administration, and then the remaining twenty-five goes into the pilot fund, and then all that money is pooled and then redistributed to towns and cities that own state land. So the more, the parking in with it too. Um, so in order to, but we don't know, and we don't know what kind of comeback there will be. We don't know when we're gonna start parking. We don't know when local options will start coming in. We don't know, there's so many unknowns. So basically we've, we've taken what we hope is a worst case scenario, but we also don't know that, it, it could get lower. And we've, we've said, all right, we're gonna review this every quarter and see how we're doing, are we doing better, can we put some things back, or do we need to hold, or should we be cutting what even, we away? gonna get to that. So I was just trying to explain how, how we're approaching it, the problem. So what we tried to look at were what could be deferred or delayed, and I think this is really, and, and I will talk specifically, I'm not trying to talk around, but I think it's important for people to understand, if this were gonna be a permanent one and a half million dollar reduction, like never coming back, we would look at our budget entirely differently. I think we'd be saying, okay, we've got to reduce programs, we've got to reduce staff, we've got to, you know, we've got to, we've got to ratchet down to this new level. Because we think it's a one to one and a half year issue, the question is how can we continue providing the services that people expect from us and put things on hold? So we've got a fair amount of uh, street projects. We're still gonna do two or three this summer, but we've deferred three or four of them. And again, when we say deferred, it doesn't mean canceled because maybe 
by springtime, we'll be back in a position to do them. That's still in the same fiscal year. Operational, and how much for that is capital budget? So we've got capital budget. We've got we've got about three hundred thousand in equipment out of our five hundred thousand that we're again we're putting off. Like I said, maybe next spring, still in the same fiscal year, revenues are better. We can we can get caught up again. Um, we've we've furloughed twenty five employees that we have since March. Uh, What's the denominator? Twenty five out of about one hundred and ten. Okay. Um, some of, about eleven of those will come back on July one, just because of summer needs. The remainder will stay through till August one, and then we'll we're planning to have them come back unless the, the bottom has fallen out. We're freezing about five or six positions um, that are open right now uh, that we think we can keep open at least for some we're going to freeze for the whole year, some we're just going to freeze for the first quarter. So for example, there's a couple of vacant public works positions, and we think we can get till October without them, but we know we need them for the winter. Right. I mean, it's going to snow whether we're having a pandemic or not, right. and we need to clear the road. So, so we need to be prepared for that. So we're really trying to look at all the different ways that we can hold the line without completely reshaping our government until we know that that's something that we have to do. So it's a challenge. And, uh, but our staff has been great uh, from you know, the working people to the, the management folks uh, really have been um, thinking and offering suggestions, and most of our departments, uh, with the exception of the public safety departments, have been running short um, because of the furloughs, and they're just making it work. You know, they're really, they're just doing what they can. You know, we can, DPW has really, I think they've got six or eight people out, uh, and they're just making it, making it happen. You know, um, as best as they can. So if people see. You know, occasionally we'll get a call, you know, this pothole hasn't been failed on my road. And it's like, yep, and it, it's going to be a little slower than usual. Yes, the, the lines haven't been painted in the streets yet. You know, those are kinds of things that we might normally have done by now. Um, but we're, we're on it. We're working. We're trying to, you know, we have to still have to respond to water leaks or whatever other emergencies you have. Um, you know, our, our rec department has been almost completely furloughed, so people, you know, see that grass hasn't been... What is, go, what is going on with recreation in terms of the summer camps? Uh, the Mountaineers so, have been canceled. The Mountaineers have been canceled. Uh, the pool is not going to open um, just because we can't manage the close proximity of, of people plus, you know, the costs. There are going to be summer camps. They're going to have to be managed completely differently. Uh, they're going to be in more locations with smaller groups, and there are some guidance now from the state about how to do them. So I think last year we had about 130, 140 camp slots. We might have about 80 this year. So you know, significant reduction in opportunities for people. And the information on that, it, the up-to-date information is on the recreation department site. That's correct. Yes, and um, as they're developing it, and again, they're. They're just be going to be bringing back some of their program people after July 1. When do you think that will begin, the summer camp? Uh, I think in July, once they get the folks on board. Yeah, there, it's, that is really one of their number one you know, planning things. If there's... And the same with Senior Center, so well, just... Well, I'm going to come to that okay. in a second. Uh, same issue. Yeah. If, there's a, um, if there's a reduction in slots from 120 to 80, will Montpelier residents have priority for those 80 slots? I believe that's correct. Yeah, I think that's right. That's usually the way it works anyway, so. Uh, what about the casual pickup softball game? As I understand it from the governor, softball, well, so the problem that we have with city facilities, so as I understand it, softball is, is apparently okay because that's inherently, as long as you don't stand too close in the, in the dugout. Uh, so look, we, you're we, not a catcher or a batter. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's some guidance there. Um, but we're not running our leagues, and um, part of the problem we have with, with playgrounds, so the city only has two playgrounds that it manages, the rest are, are, are under the school. So the school's following their own protocols that they're getting from Department of Ed, which are slightly different than ours. But, Libby and Jim will speak yeah, to that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we have not opened our playgrounds because we, can't, we, we don't have people to clean them. So we can't go in and sterilize them on now, a regular Which playgrounds are you speaking of? So there's the one on Elm Street by the, by the, the pool, one and then the one behind the Senior Center on Barry Street. Those, are, those two are the city's playgrounds, not school. What about Dog River? That's not really a playground. It's, it's no. a baseball field. Right, yeah. So, but I was specifically talking about playgrounds. Because we can't, 
we can't go in and sterilize and say that this is safe to use. Are people using are they them? They probably are. Uh, well, not really. There's signs up. Okay. Um, you know, there may be people using them, but we're, we're not actively supporting that. Uh, the same thing with the fields. We, we haven't had the people to mow them, so we're just starting to get, you know, doing the, the field maintenance and those kinds of things that um, for people who are going to use them, you know, spread out, play Frisbee or something like that. Um, but most of the organized activities that we normally have won't occur because of the safety. We just can't guarantee it. Which brings us to the Berry Street facility. Is that closed? The one that across is? from the senior center? Yes, it is closed. How do you anticipate? Now, again, when you and I spoke about that facility in February, we were talking about possibly replacing that mm -hmm. facility. I'm, I'm going to zig and zag for this. What are the plans on that? The city council took a formal vote. Uh, you know, they had been on track, as I think we talked about in February, to have that as a bond vote in November. Uh, they said no earlier than next March, uh, and it's really going to depend on the economy and people, you know, they, they don't see that they can... You now, what was the plan that would have been as we're zigging and zagging on this. So the plan was, it was about a $5 million, five to $6 million renovation of that building to more modern use, handicapped accessible, better lighting, better HVAC, uh, you know, and, and there's a huge amount of space in the basement that's really unusable. It would, in the, in the arm, right, but in the basement right, of right. the, the, the gym. Right. Yeah, exactly. So open up a lot more space for public use, make it more accessible, and then we would also be able to run camps and things in it and other programs. Right now, you can't really have any formal programming in there because it's not ADA accessible. So the, the plan is was to in, invest money to renovate that building. That may still be the plan in the future, but it will, certainly won't be in the short term because of until people's but, financial. But in the short term, we plan to open that building again when appropriate. We'll open it to the extent that it was open before. Okay. At some point. That, that will not close waiting for the new building? No, I don't believe so. Um, let's cross the street to the senior center. So they've been closed, and that makes sense. You know, that's one of the more vulnerable populations. Uh, they are still serving their meals, and the meal's on wheels, and there's a, I couldn't explain exactly how it works, but you can go in, I think, get a meal and do takeout. Uh, and that's been still a successful program uh, in delivering meals. But in terms of regular programming, they're trying to do some online, um, and they are working with the state to try to come up with protocols to reopen senior centers. But really, if we're going to be cautious, like that's the place we're going to be the most cautious because the elder population is is the highest risk. So um, again, it would have to be we have to really pay attention to our cleaning protocols and our distancing and what kind of programs we offer. And uh, and so they're trying to get creative. You know, can you do an exercise class on Zoom where you, you know, you're to exercising. try and maintain the community? Yeah, and also the services that people you know people like and use. And uh, so. Could someone teach you how to do yoga when you watch them on the screen and do it at your own home? And uh, you know, how does that work? So we're, we're trying to figure that all out. Um, this, again, there's, uh, we've reduced most of the staff there, but the couple of folks that are still there are trying to figure out how to retool the place too. I mean, Let's stay on social services. The city has about $100,000 that it subcontracts for social services. What's going on with that fund funding that's external now? Right. The community fund you're talking about. Yes. We have, so that is not on our cut list for uh, this, for our projected cuts for a couple of reasons. One, I think social issues are, are critical. Um, there are services there that the city can't provide, you know, battered women's shelters and uh, all those kinds of things, you know, services for addictions, services for, you know, health and hospice. These are all things that are just needs in the community. So we have this fund. And so that's number one. And then number two, those awards were made earlier in the year. So, I, you know, those agencies have been told how much they were getting from the city. But now, those services are still being delivered. Yes, they as are. We speak. Correct. Correct. And, you know, some of that, so, to some of the funding for some of those agencies is actually pretty small. That They get a couple thousand dollars from the city. And to, you know, take 500 bucks from that, it just seemed like that wasn't a good practice. So we, we left that as is. So that's still happening. Um, you know, it's interesting with social services, and, and I'm going to go on, you know, to a little higher plane here for a minute. I think that the, the policy practice of the federal and state government really since the 80s to systematically roll back 
funding and, and programming and social services and push it down, push it down, push it down, is really, in some sense, coming to roost now. Now, I'm not saying this excuses some of the misbehavior in police departments in the country, but the extent, to the extent to which local governments now are having to deal with homelessness, having to deal with addiction, having to deal with you know, families in crisis, having to and deal with mental, mental illness, um, it's because the resources just aren't there other places. Not because, you know, in Vermont, if you look at the way local governments are set up in Vermont, it's, it's not intended for the local governments to be dealing with social services. The state is supposed to be taking care of it. There's a Department of Human Services. That's who's supposed to be doing with it. They're supposed to be adequately funded with state and federal dollars. We're supposed to help where we could. Way back in the day, you know, there were overseers of the poor. And each town had a town poor farm. And those all were done away with in favor of professionalized practices, you know, mental health services, those kinds of things, regional Washington County Mental Health, Howard Center in Burlington. These, these were set up to provide these models in communities. And they're being overwhelmed. That system is being overwhelmed. And so it, by nature, falls to us. So we found ourselves in the last year or so um, starting to put money in, to area, other, in addition to the community fund for the nonprofits. Uh, to, to actually, you know, we've funded money to the Homelessness Task Force. We've funded some money to our social equity people to talk about racism in the community. We funded, um, we're, we're funding money along with the city of Barrie and the Washington County Mental Health to embed a social worker in our police departments to help assist with those non-emergency calls where we need someone who's not necessarily an officer. So this is, you know, and this, is, this was before things kind of blew up. It's just, it's, uh, it's a need that's coming on us and it's gonna require us to either push back and have the state and feds take back some of the, the, the support that they used to provide, or the cities and towns, not just Montpelier, to either put more money in or reallocate funds to deal with these problems. And, and the, the issue with that is we don't really, right now, have the expertise. Like, you know, Local government folks, especially in Vermont, we don't have social workers. You know, we don't have a human services department. We don't have, because... Which is small. Well, and it's not, if, if you look even in the statutes, we're supposed to sort of provide police, fire, public works, you know, water, sewer, plow the roads, wrecks. Like, that's what local governments do. They don't do homeless services. They don't do mental health services. They don't do social work. They don't do, so what they can do is give some money to the nonprofits that do that work. And, and, and I've always believed that that money is preventive money, that if there weren't those services, they would end up at our doorstep. They would end up in police calls. They would end up in dangerous situations. So that $100,000 or whatever it is is a good investment in the community, as far as I'm concerned, to, to meet people's needs. But, but I think we're just at a crossroads here in, in Vermont and in Montpelier as to where where and how we handle these things. When you talk about defunding the police, you know, in favor of that, um, do you really have enough police to do all the shifts as it is right now and keep police in those cars moving around the city? If you were to eliminate three police slots, would we be hard pressed to keep that number of cars on the streets? Well, something would change. Uh, we, so we currently have 17 police officers. Uh, one's the chief. And so while they're out in the community, they and occasionally fill in a shift, but th that's not their active role. And then you've got the captain who really oversees the day-to-day -day operations. There's two detectives, the school resource officer. Uh, so that leaves What us about the cop on the bike? Well, those, I, 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 so those, that's only seasonal. So that leaves basically 12 officers to shift, to, to staff 24, 7, 365, including bike shifts, those kind of things. So at any given time, there's two to four officers on duty, depending on the day of the week, the time of the day, uh, and those kind of things. You know, if we were to take three positions, you know, either we're going to stop doing detective work and solving crimes, or we're not going to have... Uh, a presence in the schools, and I know that's one of the things that people have raised, uh, but I think there's a lot of preventive work. So that's a conversation that needs to be had, is what's the value of that. And, and with Diane there, what, uh, what is she handling in terms of violence in classes and things like that that wouldn't have been handled by school staff? Um, well, I think we'd have to get some more data on that, but I know anecdotally there have been cases, even uh, elementary school kids, throwing desks, throwing chairs, uh, you know, so a teacher, Teacher's number one responsibility is to um, protect the rest of the kids. 
And so they're going to try to get remove the other kids from safety. A uh, teacher may or not be trained, and they're not really supposed to go hands-on with students. Uh, so sometimes it's just an assistance to, you know, help settle the, the child down. In other cases, it could be uh, at large, you know, it could be a bullying case or an incident of, you know, kids threatening somebody on the playground. Those kinds of things are at the school, at the lockers, those, those sorts of things. Drugs, of course, in I high school. I was just about to say, yeah, you've um, been here 25 years and you've seen drug policy in this yeah. city. Wasn't that position somewhat there because of concern by the parents? Amongst other reasons, yes. Sure. Um, if, if there's, you know, heavy duty drugs being traded and sold or used, it's, again, it's a chance to intercept that and maybe get someone on the right track rather than, you know, two years It's a human approach rather right. than a That's how we see it. cough sign approach. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. And, and I, I can appreciate the perspective, you know, you've got an armed police officer in the school, and we think of it as we have a, a person there who's there to try to intercept problems and help and, and be more human. But I can understand the other perspective, and so maybe we need to think about how they present and all those kinds of things. So, you know, we're open to those kinds of conversations. But again, uh, could you explain 21st century policing? This was a discussion that you and I had in February in the context of Tony's upcoming retirement. Correct. And 21st century policing, if you watch that, which that show is in archive in ORCA online. And um, basically, it was a new notion to me then. It's probably a new notion to most people, but it's gotten a lot of publicity. How is 21st century policing different than community policing? Is that a different? They're, they're similar. So community policing is an aspect of 21st, a, 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 a strong aspect of 21st century policing. But in, in, during the Obama administration, there were incidents of police violence, you know, Ferguson and others uh, that we can think of. And so President Obama pulled together a group of sort of police people and social people and, and created this task force on 21st century policing. Like, what does is, what is policing look like in the future? What's going to make it successful? What's going to reduce these violent incidents? What's going to create better connections? And there's a very long report on, on it. But basically, it outlines six pillars of, of 21st century policing. And I'm not going to remember all of them but they're very easily found. So it's like trust with the community, you know, open transparency, officer health and wellness, community policing, uh, clear policies and clear missions that are avail you know, available to all and, and you know, expectations. So there's, there's these six areas and basically then long explanations of best practices in all of those areas. Uh, so we have, we adopted that as policy uh, by the council and by the police department, by Chief Fakus. He went to training actually in Washington on implementing this. And so but we had already started in that direction. Oh, yeah, well that's what I was going to This was shortly after 2015 or 16. We've been implementing, trying to implement those for some time. Um, but, and as we were looking for a new chief, um, that was a very strong uh, requirement with someone who was familiar with and embraced the principles of 21st century policing, the six pillars. And Chief Pete is a, is a leader. Um, and it includes, so basically it includes partnerships like with mental health. And, and again, we have a very strong partnership with Washington County Mental Health. Our, we, we've created what we call Team Two, which is a, a, an officer and a mental health clinician training and working together and, and how they can help a person and tr you know, when to call. And Montpelier was really on the front, forefront of that, not only in Vermont, but in the country, to the point where uh, our police department and Washington County Mental Health actually present on national levels of sort of best practice here. And we're proud of that. Um, and it was definitely forward looking. Uh, there's this Act 80 training that was required by the legislature for police officers, again, to recognize mental health situations. And you know, to, to, we are very proud that we were the first department in the entire state to be 100% Act 80 trained and certified, and have maintained that. So, it's a now, could you give me an incident, uh, just a hypothetical police incident where that Act 80 training would play in? It's recognizing the circumstance, right? So, you know, just an example, a hypothetical uh, example. You, you you show up and you see a person who's struggling, and yeah, maybe they did something wrong, but you know, do you just arrest them for doing something wrong, or do you say, whoa, this person needs some help? Like they're either got a, they've got a drug issue right now or they've just got, they're not all together. And so let me call 
So it's a more holistic approach. Uh, you know, what's the actual problem going on? What's the best path to solving this problem at, at hand right now? Um, and you know, you can't, you don't always have that opportunity to uh, recognize because you're not as close to a, a situation or it's dangerous. Uh, but the idea is to get the right resources on hand and address the person's needs where they're at as opposed to just treating it as a law enforcement issue. I want to go through a few Montpelier specifics as to how 21st century policing would relate to them. Uh, we were a sanctuary, so I suppose we still are a sanctuary city. How does that relate, undocumented people? Well, I think it, so it's called... In our relationship with it's ICE. It's relationship with the community, it's relationship with people. You know, people who are undocumented are also victims of crime. They're not just, you know, people... So they are often reluctant to report a crime or to get engaged with the police department because they're afraid they're going to be found out and deported. If they believe, if they are have a confidence and a trust in the police department that they think the chiefs could maybe describe them better than I can, but you know, a domestic violence situation where they've got to, they call it, come in, and- the Attention's high. Attention's high and somebody's got a weapon. Uh, you know, our officers are there to face that. So are there, we, we do have, you know, the pepper ball launchers and those kinds of things which are considered less than lethal, but that can disarm somebody. Um, and, and, you know, you, I think the issue with tasers, the big concern with tasers, and again, we find ourselves in a situation where misbehavior by other f folks creates suspicion, understandably. This isn't that they should, people meant some departments, some individual police officers that use tasers just for compliance tools. Come with me, Sheer. You won't. I'll tase you. Well, that's painful. That's that's not the proper use of a taser, right? The proper use of a taser if you're coming at me with a knife, and maybe I can tase you instead of shoot you, or so hit that you with a club. Or, or hit you with a club. Well, if you have a knife, I hope you're not close enough that I can right. use a club. I want to keep my but distance. They are armed. With, our police are armed with clubs. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Uh, they try not to. Use, well, if they do, they use them for right. wrestling. Anyway, I, I, I'm not expert enough to talk about that. Um, we've opted not to have tasers. The, the issue, to, but to your question about 21st century p policing, one of the pillars is about proper training, proper policy. And so it's not just what you have. It's not just what you have. I mean, they have guns. It's what's the appropriate time to use them. You know, they have pepper spray. Do we have body cams? We do not have body cams. Do we have plans for body cams? So we'll talk quickly about body cams. Uh, we would love to have body cams. I mean, we've got cell phones galore to, to right. do this, but do we Right, and you know, we've actually had incidents where uh, our officers got involved in some kind of tussle and people were videoing and thinking they were gonna have the latest YouTube sensation of officers and at the end of it said, oh my gosh, that guy was so out of line. Here, here's my video for evidence. You guys handle this. What, what's the reluctance to get body cams? Is it, so uh, there's no is it budgetary? Yeah. Yes, uh, and, and well, there's a couple of things that are really important that need to be resolved before, uh, in, in particular, and the, this, some of this is Vermont specific. Number one, storage of all that digital data I mean, if you have every officer on every eight or 10 hour shift running body cam all the time, that's a huge amount of storage. So to keep it and to keep it for the amount of period of time, what are the proper protocols for when you erase it? Because obviously if you, if you can think of the abuse that could happen if you, you don't store it for, you know, so it has to be very clear. So storage is extremely expensive. Is there a Vermont city that's extensively using body cams? Uh, Burlington was. I don't know if they still are. Here's, here's the issue. So there's a, there was a Supreme Court case that has really um, put a chill, I think, on body cams in Vermont for now until there's a legislative solution. I think philosophically, I know philosophically our department would like them. Our officers would like them. We, you know, we just think if you're behaving well, and doing things the right way, let's... Well, we have car cams, don't we? We have car cams, and those are, usually, those are very good. They're very helpful to us, and we would like the body cams. But here's, here's what happened. Um, you know, you, you have to balance a lot of needs. So we also have the right in, the, in, the, in, in Vermont for public records requests, right, and open meeting and all the kind of things. So, and then in the public records law, there's a, that says, you know, you can assess a fee for providing the records if necessary. So uh, in Burlington, 
a, an individual requested a full shift of an officer's body cam. I want the whole eight hours or 10 hours. I want to, I want to have a copy of this or I want to be able to see it. Well, you have to, when, when you're doing this, you, you have to go through because there are certain protected things that are on there. Maybe they're talking to an informant. Maybe they're doing an investigation. Uh, there are things that you can't just release, and, and the, the public records law protects those. So basically, Burlington had to take a shift supervisor, a higher paid person. They had to review the entire eight hour shift and redact. and redact it and do all this stuff. So that was a per very expensive. So they assessed the cost of that officer a lot, you know, to, for it, and the individual objected, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, right, they can't charge for this. So because of the way the law is written. And so the Supreme Court was clear. We're not saying this isn't necessarily constitutional. We're saying the way the law is written right now, you don't have the right to charge for that. So if most people said, you know, if we're just going to be turned, you know, if people are going to ask for these because they just want to see what a cop's doing all day, every day, um, we need, and we're going to have to review them all, this becomes a ridiculously um, untenable situation. We can't spend the time and effort to do that. And so I, I, think, I think maybe even Burlington stopped using them. And so this is a Vermont-specific version of this problem, but it needs to be dealt with by the legislature uh, somehow. I don't know what the right answer is, but um, obviously there's a, there's a line where public transparency is really important and, and public access to records is important, but also uh, not overburdening the taxpayers in the communities with uh, this inordinate uh, burden. I, I want to play a hypothetical. Uh, my son's been roughed up by the police, and I just don't think that's right. What, um, what is my son's right to file a complaint against that police person? What is the process that that complaint goes through in Montpelier? So, absolute right, you can file a complaint. Uh, it goes, we have an internal investigations policy. Depending on the nature of the complaint, it might be referred to an outside agency, state police or another police department so that we're not investigating it ourselves. Uh, depending, I mean, the first thing we would look is, is there, is there video, um, is there car video? Is there, are there you know, witnesses? Is, what are the circumstances that you know, we can verify? And obviously, if the officer's wrong, they're dealt with. How are they dealt with? What, uh, is there a police union in, in Montpelier? Yes, there is. Do, uh, does the police union have the kind of sway that it has in large cities? Uh, people are concerned about the power of police unions. You're, we're in a small town. You've been working with these people. So uh, first thing I want to say is we have an excellent police department, and we have an excellent police union. We have really good relations with them. I think we've been able to reach good agreements on contracts. They're, they represent good people. I don't think they want bad actors any more than we do. But we need to prove our case, uh, just like any cop needs to prove their case, right? So, prove it to who? Well, so, so we have a just cause standard, right? So if, if we issue discipline and the officer or the union feels it's not justified, they can grieve it. So it goes up, goes from the supervisor to the chief to me, and then ultimately to an arbitrator. A, a third neutral third party, and then you, that so that's when you have to prove your case. We have very very few, if any, cases that go. It's, I would say only termination cases really go to go to an arbitrator. Um, otherwise, it just gets resolved, and um, and you know it forces management to do its homework and make sure it's it's not our. You know, the, the flip side of it is we could just say right sheer up because we don't like him. You know, pick on him. Let's get, we want to get rid of him, so let's start giving him warnings. And so the union's there to say, wait a minute, no, you can't just pick on an employee. So, so you know, we, we have a responsibility to be good management. They have a responsibility to protect employees. Uh, but I wouldn't say they're more powerful. I'd say, if anything, the, the ability to go to arbitration, which is something that the, the citizens here voted for, and we have that in all of our unions, not just, not just police, sets a, a, a strong standard. I mean, that's a legal proceeding. You know, you have to make sure you've got your ducks lined up. So, so taking a step to go to arbitration is a big deal, and you really want to make sure you've got a solid case. A civilian police review board, has that been discussed? It's been discussed. What are your views on a civilian police review board? I don't know what, uh, so I, I think transparency is important. 
I don't know what their scope would be. You know, we have a pretty clear governmental structure. Well, in Montpelier, it would be talked to death before it actually happens. True, but I think, so we have, you know, the, the, there's a police chief who has the oversight of the department. They're my employee. My job is to oversee all departments. So they're accountable to me, and we set certain standards for, for police. And then I work for the city council, who are the civilian review board for the entire city. The so elected. the elected city council, right. So they are, it's really their job to provide that sort of oversight. And, you know, if you, you're a follower of, of city council to some extent, you know that when issues, when there are issues of dissatisfaction in the community, those are what takes up the council's time, right? So if people are upset about something or they want something or there's a, a you know, a, a problem, um, police just haven't been one, I think in part, here, so you know, there hasn't shown in Montpelier. I don't think the data shows that there is misbehavior by the police, or that they. And in fact, we've talked about many of their forward-thinking uh, efforts that we've described: the 21st century and the social worker and all this. Those have all been presented to the, the city council and, and approved. So I, you know, is is a civilian review board just going to? Are they going to have management say in the department? Are they just to meet and understand? So I think there's, what does this mean? What, what's their role? And, and how can they be useful and not just something else? And how are they selected? Are they people that have access to grind with the police? Or are they have people that are supporting the police? You know, they're all backers. You know, I think that's one of the concerns. You know, when you create a special agency, you get people that are only interested in that one thing, whereas our council has to balance the needs of the community across all the The elephant in this studio is Black Lives Matter. Okay. Uh, what do the pullover data look like in terms of, of ethnic minorities being pulled over for traffic offenses? Ours are very good. Um, they really mirror the population of the city um, pretty much. I think it's like 3% pull over for African American, and it's like two and a half percent population, so it's very, very close um, in the same, well, the only place where it's not matching is men versus women. A lot more men get pulled over, but I think that may have to do driving habits more than... Um, well, I would imagine much more <laughs> men get pulled over in any case. Right, but, but I mean, I, I think that could be because of the way they drive, not necessarily the, the just that we're going to pull this man over. Um, but yeah, no, we are, are very good. We train, our, our folks train on implicit bias. They train on um, all, all those kinds of, you know, cultural competency. Uh, they, they try to deal with all this stuff, and, and we do track that. What was the process that led us to a huge thing you can see from airplanes in front of uh, the state capitol? The, the painting? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think just you know, the country's at a boiling point right now and uh, over these issues and what we've seen from police departments. So I, I'm here, I will speak and defend our Montpelier Police Department because I think they're great. Yeah. But that's a larger statement but, than, than the but, Montpelier Police Department. Right. What we've seen from some police officers and departments around this country is just abhorrent. It's, it's criminal. And you have a population that's borne the brunt of that uh, for many, many years. And in the cell phone era, you know, we watched a man get murdered on, on, on television, and it was wrong, and there was, you know, for, for bouncing a check. And I think that, coupled with everything else, has, you know, and plus the fact that we're in an economic depression, we're in this pandemic, I think people just exploded, and it became important. You know, we had this rally, which was amazing. I don't know if you were able to attend that rally and uh, listen to people of color in our state, in our city, talk about their pain and anger, um, in ways that most of us just can't understand. We, I know we can't understand it because we don't live it. And, um, and I feel that while action is the most important, the city council felt that making statement of where our beliefs were, and you know, the governor supported this, this is, this is where we are. We believe that um, black folks have been marginalized. We believe that they've been systematically uh, oppressed, and they do matter, and yes, all lives matter, but you know, I've heard, heard a good example recently, if you go to the doctor with a broken arm and they say, well, all bones matter, you're like, no, I want my arm fixed. And I think in this case, we've got one segment of our society that's been bearing a lot more burden than the rest of it, and so yes, they matter. We need to pay attention to this. We need to get this right. And uh, So the council saw this as more Beyond a, a, a city issue. Yes, that this is, 
Well, I mean, racism exists in Montpelier. You know, you and I are racist, even though we don't want to admit it. We are because there's certain inherent things that happen. We don't. We try. We do our best to avoid it, but we were. We have a perspective that we can't understand because we didn't grow up black, and um, so the council said yes. This is a symbol of, of what's going on in the country, and it's a symbol of how we, as our community, and I think the governor agreed that our state, we want to do better. I mean, look, we just had a legislator resign from the legislature because she was being systematically harassed for being black. I mean, it's, it's here. You know, the fact that, that our, our painting was vandalized that night. I mean, there are people that are angry and hatred uh, over this thing, and, and we have to do better. The schools have long had Black Lives Matter flags flying on the flagpole. Mm -hmm. The city, is the city going to take yes. that move? Yep, so the schools did it two years ago in 2018, led by uh, the, some of the same folks that led the, the rally and, and the painting, and they're just wonderful uh, community, young community leaders, I'm very proud of them. Uh, and the school uh, took the lead and was the first public school in the country to do that, and uh, something Montpelier can and is rightfully, should be proud of. I think the middle school has since followed suit. Um, so the city council, when they approved the, the painting on the street, and, and mind you, that's a federal aid street, so the state also had to approve it. The city doesn't have unilateral right to, to do that. Um, but the governor approved it and made sure that VTrans approved it. And, uh, and so we had some In record time. In record time. Well, uh, you know, some, most, most of the time, there's a reason for a process and for playing things out and is to allow for a lot of debate. But sometimes there's urgency. And I think people felt a sense of urgency here. Um, so this council at the same time did vote to raise the flag. We're uh, discussing a flag policy at the next meeting so that there's clear parameters around which this is done and we've ordered a flag. So when we get it, we'll, we'll raise it. What's coming up at the council meetings of the next couple of weeks? What, what, what's on the agenda? Um, and so then if after that, could you discuss the reopening of City Hall possibly? Sure. Well, this coming week, we will be finalizing our budget plan for the next year. We'll be talking about um, Langdon Street. There's a proposal to close half of Langdon Street, and we'll be trying to go through the logistics of how that might work. Could you explain that, the closing of Langdon? Well, so we've just recently approved an ordinance amendment that would basically allow any business to have a parklet downtown for this year, uh, to use parking spaces and kind of eschewed the, the normal requirements that we have for the more permanent parklets. So if the Quirky Pet, for instance, wanted to put a table out in a couple parking spots, they could get approval to do that. Um, Said because, as most of you know, that's my wife who yes. owns it. Just picking, I happened to choose that business. Um, but so the idea, you know, people have long talked about closing Langness, you just making it a pedestrian mall kind of thing. We are not really able right now to, in fact, we're prohibited from creating public gathering spaces because that's really, we don't want people to just gather aimlessly, right? You want, we want people, um, but, but there was a sense that this is a chance to try what closing the street might look like. However, two of those are, are liquor establishments, are bars. And restaurants. Right, and restaurants. Um, and so part of it was, yes, they could put seating out in the street, some of these other, in, uh, but it would have to be permanent. So it would close right from about Onion River Sports across, and then the big opening it would become two-way. We're, we're working out the logistics now. And a fire truck can get through that. Fire truck can get through that. That would be one of the requirements. So, so what the council said is we would like to try this configuration. You staff, DPW engineers, fire, you come up with a plan that could work. So we're supposed to be presenting a plan next week for them to review. So that's on the agenda. Um, Every meeting now, we do an update on what's going on with COVID and, and, and all this kind of thing. So that's on. A um, couple of appointments. Uh, it'll be each of fake assessments. What's going on? What's going on with the uh, committees? So the committees are basically on hold because, again, partly because so much staff is gone. So a lot of the committee staff is on furlough. Um, people, you know, it's all being done by Zoom, done by remote. Uh, process. If somebody really, I think there's there's a couple things, like if there's an emergency or something that really needs to be dealt with, like a grant opportunity, then they can request and we... What's going on with zoning permits? So those, so those are still happening. So the, the, when the council did the committee policy, they said anything that's required by statute or, or, or rule or law to happen will continue to happen. So DRB is still meeting, DRC is still meeting, Planning Commission is still meeting. 
um, uh, remotely, but they're still meeting. And um, what about actually getting into City Hall to the city clerk to you? So we can do that by appointment, um, although mostly we've been able to do it by Zoom or by uh, things. For the city clerk, uh, there, he, he has got a, if you were to have to do a title search, you're an attorney, he'll set up an appointment. There's only can be like one of them or two of them at a time in different rooms and everyone's notified. We are um, planning a slow reopening once our staff comes back. So it will be after July 1. It'll probably be at first just two days a week. And again, masks are required. Um, distancing and again trying to urge people to use remote services as much as possible. The theater upstairs. The theater has canceled their season. The mask ordinance downtown, that's an important one. Mm -hmm. Would you explain the mask ordinance? Well, you know, there's a lot of debate about masks, but it seems that the, uh, the, the experts are recommending them. Uh, so the Department of State Department of Health, the, you know, the World Health Organization, other places like that are, are calling for masks. Um, many businesses felt uneasy about opening without, you know, they wanted to require people to have masks, which is it was also possible for businesses to do it on their own. Uh, there had been some, but then there was a sense, well, some will, some won't, and it was, um, it provided some backup for everybody if we, if the city just said, if you're going to be inside a, a place of commerce, then you need to have a mask on. We, we haven't restricted it to the sidewalks or outdoor running, you know, people like that, uh, some, because some of the harder hit communities have said you got to have them all the time. But certainly if you're going inside to a a commercial or establishment or business establishment, you have to be wearing a mask. So what? That is going right now. That is that in is effect. effect now. What about meetings, um, like gatherings in Hubbard Park and in the, in the shelter houses? Yeah, this is where it gets. Uh, this is where it gets interesting, right? Because there's no real clear guidance about a lot of this. So if you're one family and you all live together and you decide to have a picnic at Hubbard Park. Sure. I mean, you don't need, really need a mask. If you're a bunch of strangers, in theory, you should be six feet apart, probably masked. You know, the, the rally at the State House, they re required masks. And, I, you know, I did not see a single person at that rally without a mask. It was very impressive, actually. And even on the lawn, I noticed that people seemed to be sitting kind of in pot, like, you know, I was there with my family, you know, and then there was a little distance in another part. You know, people seemed to be trying. Once it, they got marching in the street, there was no distancing, uh, but people could opt out of that if they didn't want to do it. Um, so I think it's, you know, a lot of this can be done through regulation. A lot of this has to be done out of kindness for your fellow person, right? You know, you've got to, I mean, the, ma the most important thing about the mask is, is preventing you from infecting somebody else. It's also showing collective concern for the community. Right, right. That's, that's what I mean. So people have to, to some extent, people have to want to do these things. and. Um, and it, if people, it, it's, it's counterintuitive in some way, but if people use the proper caution, then that will allow things to reopen quicker because it will be safe. If people, as we've seen in other states and other cities, where people have rushed to get rid of these requirements and open too soon, now they're all seeing spikes and they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do. I'm going to talk to John Odom about this, but I'm going to assume that people aren't going to watch that show. The election that's coming, the primary election in August, it will be in City Hall. I believe that's correct, but also it will be um, mail-in. And But there will be a live presence in City Hall. I think that's right, and John will talk to you about how that works. And then, of course, we have November. Is there anything that I've missed? Uh, I mean, you and I have covered so much turf today, and I, and I do appreciate your being here. And, Talking to it's everybody. always my pleasure. I'm happy to talk to you and to the public about um, matters of, of city interest, so I, I appreciate it. And I, I think uh, I, I'm glad you're going to have uh, Chief Fakus and Chief Pete on. Chief Pete's going to be a wonderful addition to the community. He's a great person, and uh, we're looking forward to having him. And of course, Chief Fakus uh, has just. Now, just, just for an aside, when that happens, Chief Fakus and Chief Pete will be seated. I will be a disembodied voice for that particular show, so get used to it. And several of these shows, I will be a disembodied voice. I'm sure you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, but I think some, they will be able to address some of the questions you had about policing and those kinds of things much more, and, and certainly 21st century and community policing and 
uh, less lethal, all those kind of you know, examples of cases, uh, much better than I can. Again, I, I ask the public to watch all of these shows. These are exemplary shows, very special. The times are special. The shows will be very special. And I thank you for watching this. And they will be archived on Orca Online, the Yahoo channel. Uh, they'll also be showing on the Orca channels. And thank you to Orca for making this possible. Good evening.